going to go to dermatology after PA school. And so that's why I went to plastics, because it was kind of like along that line. And then really towards the end is uh, head and neck is where I saw a lot of dermatology. But I saw tons of it in internal medicine as well. So these are your lecture objections. So what I'm going to talk about today is hydronitis, superativa, and then um, lipomas, inclusion cysts, and pyelonidal disease. Those are the main four topics I'll talk about today. Anybody watch Care from the Call? Mm -hmm. It's not a tool. <laughs> it's a system. So first off, we're just going to kind of talk about the skin and sweat glands. Did she already kind of go over this with you all about what are apocrine and which are apocrine? This in physiology. Okay. So this is just a repeat for you all, but the one we're going to talk about this morning is the um, apocrine glands, and those are associated with hydronitis uh, superativa. So the difference between the two is most of the times the apocrine are in the axilla in the intertreus areas, groin, whereas the ecrine are in your palms and in your feet. So when you sweat, those are your ecrines, and your ecrines are all over your body. Most of your applicants are located, like I said, in the axilla, inframammary, groin areas, and stuff like that. Very cute little picture of it. So the applicant glands, you know, they are really sweat through the hair follicle, whereas the um, ecrine go actually up out of the pores. Um, and so the apocrine are more milky colored, a little bit thicker, and they can turn smelly. So when you sweat and you stink, it's usually coming from your apocrine glands, apocrine glands. And then for the ecrine, you're, they're usually thinner, clearer. So if you look at your hands when they sweat, which I've shook a lot of sweaty palms this week already. Um, <laughs> and those are your <laughs> ecrine glands. <laughs> it really is amazing. And then, you know, because I'm very big on handshaking. You know, I'm like, I want a firm handshake whether or not you're a man or a woman. So I get these little, and they're all sweaty. I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you all have sweaty palms when you all were you? I still <laughs> And I think, you know, I think the, and you, you, know, you try to make them feel calm when they come in the room, that whole empathy and really primary emotion. It works sometimes. But I've actually had several I had a couple of crying episodes in mine. Wow. I sure had a lot of crying. Wow. Wow. Anybody in this room? I don't know what I do. Huh. It's not me. I'm falling out here. Why are they crying? Why are they crying? Yeah, they're crying in the interview. Let them go cry in your interview. No. You're not going to say it if you do, are you? Well, I think they get so nervous and they may talk about a, a sensitive topic if we're talking about, you know, past history and stuff like that. It kind of comes out. I thought you meant like a fear friend, like you were just so mean. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might have done that back when I was right after school, right out of OU. I did. But there was a guy when I'm telling you, and when we did interviews right out of PA school, and he's still a PA now. He was the scariest person to interview with. I mean, pretty much every person who came out of that room they cried because it'd be like, "So you seem really nervous. What's going on? What's wrong?" <laughs> it's like I think he meant to make them cry. I don't ever mean to make them cry. It just it just happens. I don't ever want to make anybody cry, except for my children when they're back. <laughs> okay. So hydronitis. So you know, what is a person who has this? What? How would they show up in your office? Um, so most of the times they will have like a firm, sore nodule under their armpit. But what happens? How you would determine that between a regular boil or an abscess is hydronitis is usually a chronic a chronic issue. Months, years. Um, but it's usually characterized by pain, fluctuance, discharge, and they can form tracks and um, scarring. So that's how you would recognize someone who had something under the armpit. Comes comes and goes, that's how you kind of notice it if they have scar formation. And again, once you see one of these, you'll recognize it. You may have family members or yourself or friends that have had this. So it's more common in females, and the females <coughs> usually get it more in their armpits. Um, the males will usually get it in the uh, groin area. Um, peak onset, second and third decades of life, and it's more common in African Americans. 
a friend who has this and she would die if I told, if I told her that she had it. She would call me and tell me she had I mean, I'm the actual one who diagnosed her just over the phone. She would tell me what was happening and the scarring. And so I was like, well, you can see a dermatologist. And it took a long, long time, but she's finally healed up. So this is just the etiology and pathophysiology. So what happens is, you know, with the African glands, you know, it's deep down into the dermis. What happens is it gets all plugged up down there. So you can't sweat out from the top through the hair follicles. So all that plugs up, backs up, and you form bubble oil. And then what happens is if it's, you know, what's in the axilla, you get all this friction from rubbing, and that kind of unhooves it, causes inflammation, and then it ruptures um, and forms a nice big ball of inflammation. Uh, sometimes, most of the times, these are uh, aseptic, but they can become bacterial, so it's usually secondary. And the risk factors, obesity and smoking. So if you smoke, you're at risk for everything, it seems like, right? Mm -hmm. That you have to study. Real claims, yeah. Real claims, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, and then hydrangeism, because you have actually more hair, more oil, more grease, you know, just more pimples in general. Um, acne, PCOS, and lithium may trigger onset of exasperation this condition. Y'all remember what lithium was used for? Psychosis. Psychosis or bipolar, right? And um, a lot of times those people who are on bipolar medication are on taking some type of uh, psychotic, antipsychotic, right? Mm -hmm. And so what's one of the side effects of antipsychotics mm -hmm. that you have to worry about metabolically wise? Weight gain. Uh, yeah. Weight gain. Yeah. And then yeah. also yeah. diabetes. Yeah. So, I don't know. See y'all pull that out of your brain? That was how many modules ago? <laughs> <laughs> So again, just signs and symptoms, usually a painful inflammatory nodule, um, and like I said, usually they're sterile, but a lot of times most of these will get secondarily um, infected. They will usually drain, it'll be this mucopurulent drainage, sometimes it can smell. Um, but what happens is usually they will rupture, sometimes depending upon how chronic it is, they'll kind of coalesce together and then they'll form sinus tracts and eventually from that chronic inflammation and drainage, they'll form scars. Um, so you can get keloids, which are, I don't know if she's talked about keloids yet. I'm sure some of you all have known people have keloids. I'm a keloider. Um, and then you can get double comedone, so it's on both ends. So this is a picture with someone who has hydrogenitis, so it looks like it's resolving. There's someone on the groin. A little bit worse. And no, that's worse. So can you can you kind of tell the folds of the skin are really thickened? Mm -hmm. They've kind of scarred down right there. Mm -hmm. And those are all like the, those are the sinus tracks with big long lines and peeling. Does anybody know anybody who has this? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty common. You'll see it more than you think you would. Is it run in You know, it doesn't say that it's really familial, but I would think that if you have the same risk factors that you're smoker, obese, those kinds of things, and you know, or you have a little area, more acne, I would think it'd be, it would seem like it is. You know, because some people, it depends on what you believe, too. Like, I believe obesity is familial. Some people don't, you know, but I think it's lifestyle, so... So my dad has it, and then my brother has it. Get those jeans away. Yeah, <laughs> keep them away. <coughs> so how do you diagnose these patients? Usually, it's by taking a history and doing a good, thorough physical exam. I mean, like we said, you can look at her. If it's one single one, most likely could be an abscess or just a regular boil. But if it recurs, you have a couple of lesions in within six months. And you have multiple of them under the armpit, you want to start thinking maybe hydrogenitis. Mm -hmm. Oh, here you go. Yeah, this if you say, hey, my dad has it, then you might think, okay, well, maybe he has it as well. You know? Um, you really generally don't have to culture it, but you could for those who have chronic disease um, or the refractory to treatment, then I would need to culture the drainage. Um, but oftentimes it's either staph aureus or staph epidermis. Um, generally, you don't need to biopsy it unless you are concerned of a sweat in the cell. 
which is rare, but any type of chronic inflammatory skin disorder can develop into a cancer. Um, lab work you might draw, you know, since this is an inflammatory disease, you could draw a sed rate. Um, that might be high. You could do iron, serum irons. So with this type of disease, you can get chronic anemia, like chronic anemia, anemia of chronic disease or inflammatory anemia. You might draw a um, electrophoresis, a serum electrophoresis to look at the protein because sometimes these people can develop amyloidosis. Um, they'll get protein in their urine. They can even develop um, uh, nephrotic syndrome. And then lastly, ultrasound of the hair follow-up and dermal thickness. I don't know that anybody really does that, but that's something you can also do. And you want to stage these. These are kind of like, you know, with ulcers, a lot of times you'll notice in derm is a lot of staging. You want to stage how severe this disease is. So stage one, usually abscess formation. You have multiple of them, but you don't have any of the sinus tracking or the scarring. Stage two, it's more widespread. Um, you have recurrent abscesses, but still you don't have any. Uh, oh, this one. Mm -hmm. This one has tract formation and scarring. And the third one is diffuse, and then these is when they kind of coalesce together in like that third picture. That would be stage three. Um, so I would say this one is probably stage one because it's healing. This one may even be a stage one. <coughs> this one's probably a stage two. And then this one for sure would be a stage three. So just kind of know how to recognize those, okay? Um, here we go, just follow up. If you have to see these patients, most of the time if you treat them and they're doing fine, then let them go on. But now if you keep treating them in their office, say you're in family practice, and they don't get better, they seem to get more tracks, and they're progressing to stage two or three, then I would send them off to see a dermatologist, okay? Um, and if for any reason, if you think or suspect a squamous cell, I would get a biopsy. Um, and then these are other things like we've already talked about. If you suspect it could be something else or due to something else, then you might want to check some lab work. Y'all remember what releases DHEA? Adrenal medulla. Adrenal medulla. Right? Mm -hmm. And then um, testosterone, progesterone, all those things that y'all just so treatment. How do you treat these people? Um, if they're obese, if they smoke, you want them to stop smoking and you want them to lose weight. A lot of times with our patients, we would also give them, um, you could give them Hibiclens. Has anybody heard of Hibiclens? Mm -hmm. So it's that white, or I'm sorry, white, pink uh, foamy soap that usually they'll use before surgeries. You know, they may even use that a lot just to kind of keep the area clean. Um, Wearing loose under garments, especially men, if they wear <clears throat> tidy whities, my want them wear boxers or briefs to kind of keep that area aired out and decrease the area of friction. Um, loose clothing, same thing. Um, warm compresses. So if you do develop an abscess, you can draw those abscesses out. Um, and then phase one to three. So I would you could attempt medical treatment and referral. These things are kind of hard to treat. Um, these are the treatment by stage. So stage one, you could use a topical antibiotic, uh, like clomycin. <coughs> you could also do steroid injections into the lesions themselves, just to decrease that inflammation. Because um, what you're wanting to do is you want to slow the progression and decrease the chronic disease. Um, and these are just other antibiotics you could use. Now, if you had cultured it for some reason, let's say they've had one or two lesions, you culture it and they have staph aureus, you always have to remember you want to tr treat their nose. Because most of these people are colonizing staph in their nose. We all have it. We all have it, but some people tend to overgrow it. You're, and like we said, you're amazed how many times you touch your nose and you scratch your body, open the skin, you know, those who get recurrent MRSA. Um, but that's usually with Bacterban. You give them um, they have some that are actually nasal swabs, or you just give them Dr. Van and put it on Q-tip and put it up in their nose twice a day. Um, adding antiandrogen if they have.
have PCOS or something like that uh, may help, but in birth control. Stage two, these are where you're going to give them the oral antibiotics. So give them tetracycline, minocycline, doxycycline. You'll find out in dermatology, the cyclines are very popular. They like to use doxy and minocycline a lot. Um, and if they're not responsive, you can give them clindamycin or rifampin. Uh, a lot of times you can kind of just debris these in the office. I generally wouldn't. When I would see them, I would treat them with either topical or oral antibiotics. And then if I feel like they need to be unhooked or um, treated surgically, I would send them to a dermatologist. Because there they can do the laser um, where they would just kind of laser the upper surface off and let it heal by a secondary intention. So I'm sure, I don't know if they talk about secondary intention healing is you don't cover it or you don't sew it up, you just let it heal from the inside out. And then stage three disease, I never prescribed these. Again, they were usually sent to a uh, dermatologist by this time. You can use tumor necrosis factor inhibitors um, like Humira is a good one. Um, Humira is used a lot. Remember, I'm sure she talked about it in GI, used with ulcerative colitis, um, things like that. And then they can do a wide surgical excision, so they have to cut out all that scarring and all that trapping and tunneling. Um, which sounds horrible. Um, and then you can again do ablative surgery with CO2 lasers or erbium or YAG. And I'm sure you'll hear that throughout dermatology. Those are just different types of um, lasers. We use a lot of those in rather plastic surgery. We use a lot of those for facial resurfacing too as well. And this is just a nice little chart. I'm a chart person, look, um, a flow on how to kind of work your way through something like this. Okay. And like I said, some of these take a lot longer to heal. It's a chronic disease, chronic process, and it can be very frustrating for your patient um, that if they can't get better or not getting better. Um, but so again, like I said, they recur for years, last for years. My friend, I think hers, she still deals with it, but it's not as severe as it was initially. She still has a scar and a small little tract that sometimes will drain things. And the way she talks on what <laughs> it'll drain down the side, and it'll kind of smell sometimes. And, but for the most part, it's better than what it was. Before, it was really bad and really painful for her. Um, again, complications. You can get squamous cells. You can get amyloidosis. And so the most common thing I would want you guys to know for this is that if you have the chronic draining tract, sinuses, that you can develop spinal cell with it. Questions? Yes? Is the um, ablative laser surgery also curative, <laughs> like the um, excision is curative? Uh, I, I haven't looked up, I didn't look up the cure rate for those. I would think that the wide local would be better, mm -hmm. just because you can get more of the deeper and wider excision. You can actually do outside of the margins, you know. With the YAG lasers, usually they just treat the lesion itself, okay. you know, the top, the upper surface. Mm -hmm. But some of those lasers can, the beams do go pretty deep. So I'd have to look and see what the difference is as far as um, efficacy, one versus the other. Okay. I guess it just depends on the, the extent of the disease and how wide it is. Oh, and before I forget, now this is up to you guys, which I, if I get done early, would you want Professor Hughes to finish this, her lecture up? I think she just had a few spots, so that way you guys will have to do it tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Lipomas. Anyone here have a lipoma? I did. I had it removed. You did? Uh -huh. So I love lipomas just because they're so squishy. Maybe that's why, I, if I was a kid, I probably would love those squishies. You know, the kids are all obsessed with squishies. Do y'all know what those are? Mm -hmm. They have little kids. There's like basically these giant rubbery balls from China that come in unicorn shapes, cakes, they're all like they're just lipomas. <laughs> so it's the most common soft tissue tumor, um, benign or malignant. So you'll see a lot of people with these. You may even notice family members now that you've been introduced to this that have these. Um, so they're slow growing, they're usually benign. 
Um, but most times I would see them on the backs, the shoulders. Um, you can see them on the face. I think my mom had one on, she had one here, I think, and maybe one here. See them on the scalps, those kinds of things. Um, but they can occur anywhere on the body. But basically, it's a big fatty tumor. Mm -hmm. um, so these are a mesenchymal tumor, so they can, like I said, develop on any organ of the body. Um, usually these are sub-Q, so usually they're not adhered to the underlying fascia. You can develop them in, your, in the GI tract, the esophagus. Um, I really didn't see that many, I mean, obviously I wasn't in GI, but I never really saw that many lipomas um, in the body. I saw them more on the surface area. Um, rare locations, you can have endocrine organs, maxillofacial. Now, I will say on the maxillofacial lipoma, I had a lady, super nice lady, um, when I was in head and neck, she came in, she had a lipoma that hung underneath her chin. It was literally this big. And I don't know how long it's been there, how long it grew. It, gets, it got to a point why, I was like, why, I wonder why is she coming in now? Well, now that she's older, I don't remember if she got a divorce, but she was kind of ready, ready to go back out and date, you know, but it was huge underneath her chin. And we actually had to do them in several different um, stages because it was so big. So they did one, and then we'd sew her up, and she'd have to have a, a, a drain in there because, you know, with these lipomas, when you remove them, it's an empty space, right? And so what does your body like to do with empty spaces? Fill it with fluid. So they always have to have drains. So then we would remove it and debulk it again and so on and so on. But it never, I don't know that he ever got it all the way back to her. I mean, she was, by the time I left, she had had the second surgery. So I don't know if she's planning on it anymore. Because then what happens is when you remove them, you remove that tissue and then you get it too tight. You know, and then you never know with her how she would scar. You know, because with a lot, like when we had our thyroid surgery, some people scarred so bad when they had um, hematomas. It looked like wrinkly trash paper that was stuck up to her neck. So you don't want that in a lot of people. So if they develop hematomas, you worry about removing too much of it and making it more disfiguring than it was to begin with. So normally you'll see these in older adults, 40 to 60 year olds. Um, there are some conditions where you'll see in younger children um, lipoblastomas and lipo or diffuse lipomatosis, which means that those are just going into the deeper layers down into the muscle. Um, females can have more of what are called chondroid lipomas, so it's a mixture of fatty tissue and chondroid matrix tissue. And then uh, myo lipomas, which are muscle and fatty tissue. And then you can also have. Um, Adiposis dolorosa, which is painful lipomas. Um, men, you can have what are called spindle cell or pleomorphic lipomas, and that's just the type of cell that it is. We used to see spindle cells and pleomorphic adenomas in head neck because they were usually in their parotid glands, but those are still benign, but with those they tend to recur. Um, so I'm not sure if the same way with these uh, lipomas. And a lot of men's, I would see, they would have them in their shoulders, a lot of them were in their shoulders, um, behind the neck, um, those kinds of things. And then you can have something called uh, multiple symmetric lipomatosis, where you just have both shoulders, both arms, both back, you know. And then approximately 5% of patients have multiple lipomas, which I found that interesting because most of my patients who had lipomas, all of them had multiple of them. You know, um, this one gentleman I remember, he had them in his arm, he had them done on his legs, some of them were smaller, some of them were bigger. Um, it was kind of interesting, so I thought that was a kind of low number, but most of mine that had them had multiple of them. So risk factors, again, they're not really sure what causes lipomas to grow, uh, but these are some possible risk, risk factors. Obesity, um, alcohol abuse, liver disease, um, and soft tissue traumas. So they're really not sure why these fatty tumors like to grow and get encased in the, the cyst-like structure. So a lot of these, usually they're asymptomatic. Um, most people will know 
also all of a sudden notice a little tumor in their arm that they'll be seen, and they're like, oh, what's this? And then, but they didn't notice it until they just happened to be washing or, you know, something like that. How did you notice yours? I got a massage, and they're like, oh, you have a little bump. It was right here. Uh -huh. And then it kind of grew a little while. So I was like, I've had a skin cancer before, uh -huh. so I just got it removed just yeah. to make sure. Uh -huh. um, and it was just a lipoma. Okay. Yeah, I mean, most times, like I said, they either have had it forever, yeah. and then all of a sudden they're like, starts developing another one, or their mom and dad had them, and they're like, oh, this is what I've got. I have them. But they're usually, like, slow growing. Um, so if it's something that you've had or bump you've had forever, all of a sudden it starts to grow rapidly, you need to be concerned. Mm -hmm. Or if it's something that's growing rapidly, it's definitely not that like only. Um, in this way, symptom severity, like I said, if it's in the oral pharynx or in the GI, you might have some obstructive symptoms. But generally on the skin, they don't have many symptoms. You could, I guess, on most men, if they have it in the shoulder, you can get an impingement because it's pushing against nerves. You might have some impingement syndrome with that. Excuse me. Diagnosing. So usually you diagnose a patient probably just by a physical exam. Um, they often, like I said, feel kind of soft, kind of rubbery. Could you really, when you had it, did you, could you just kind of move it around and it would just kind of be squishy? Yeah, it was just squishy. So you have this what we call a slippage sign where you just kind of put your hand across it and it just slips across underneath your hand. Mm -hmm. Just like that lady did in the pelvic exam, I remember she talked about just kind of slowly mm -hmm. gliding it mm -hmm. over. But the lipomas, you can feel them a lot. They're a little bit more firmer mm -hmm. than the over, you know, not quite as indistinct. But um, they have a distinct feel to them, a texture to them. A lot of times you can kind of confuse them with a, a cyst, you know, just a regular old uh, sebaceous cyst. Um, but usually they, the overlying skin is normal color. You don't even see it. It shouldn't be red. It shouldn't be drained. Usually they don't have a punctate center. So those are things that you think about when you think of a, a, a tumor underneath the skin to help you differentiate them from other things. Um, commonly, less than 5 centimeters. But like I said, if they're big, like that ladies, we did have to do imaging just to make sure it wasn't something more serious about tissue biopsy. But they're usually bigger than 10 centimeters, you want to rule out that it's not something called a liposarcoma, which is a cancer of a fatty tissue tumor. Which, that reminds me, there was a gentleman that I had in the head and neck clinic. He had a, a lipoma right here on his shoulder, and he'd gone somewhere and had it biopsy, which I don't know if they did an FNA, mm -hmm. and he's, they were told it was just a plain old lipoma. So when he came to us and he wanted it removed, um, we did imaging, and then when they excised it, or I can't remember if they excised it or did a more of a, what's called a core biopsy, they got a bigger amount of tissue, it actually came back as a light bulb. So how you get hate to say, oh, sorry, that's not benign, it's actually a cancerous tumor. That happens a lot, because also tissue tumors like this, a lot of times they don't want you to just do an FNA. So like even our patients who have lymphoma, if they have a tumor anywhere, uh, a soft tissue tumor, they didn't want us to just get um, and then they wanted to just get a four needle biopsy, so it gives you more tissue. FNAs are good with persistent. So this is a life, typically this is what you would see is a life on the back. I had many patients that had those. I had one patient that had one on his um, bicep, so he looked like Popeye. <laughs> he loved it. This one on the temple. There's one that's up on the shoulder, so you can kind of see how that would impinge sometimes, causing discomfort, or maybe even sometimes pain just because of the location. And that's common there, and you have them in the back, face the neck. Again, how do you diagnose this? Usually it's just by physical exam. Um, like I said earlier, if you're concerned or if it's a larger lesion, you can always do an ultrasound. Um, or even a, a CT scan, but I would probably start with an ultrasound just because you're not exposing them to radiation, okay? But like for our patients, since hers was so big and she was going to have surgery on it, we have to get preoperative imaging to make sure it's not adhered to anything or isn't wrapped around something. This is just a talking a little bit more about MRIs, ultrasounds. So when in doubt, I would get imaging. If you're not sure, you can always do an 
uh, an ultrasound. And usually they can tell by what it looks like um, to, to define it. Regular borders, nice and sharp, those kinds of things. I already told you about the guy that I thought he had like a sebaceous cyst or anything in the arm, right? It turned out to be a melanoma. Mm -hmm. So it was a guy that I had seen, I had seen him actually in internal medicine, he was my patient. And then when I went over to the head and neck clinic, he had actually had, uh, I think he had tongue cancer. So he was just coming in for his yearly exam and I was seeing him. Then he happened to mention, hey, can you look at something for me? I've got this little bump underneath my arm. And I was like, I'm only here, but I used to take care of everything else. But I was like, okay. So I was like, I felt it. It was about, I don't know, one to two, maybe one to two centimeters. It was kind of mobile. It was removing, wasn't tender at all. And I thought, well, maybe it can be a sebaceous cyst or, you know, a lipoma. I sent him for an ultrasound, and then I also sent him for an ultrasound FNA because it was smaller, and actually it came back as a melanoma. So it was a sub-Q melanoma. So somewhere, I, I looked on this, when he came back, and I had to tell him that, I looked on his arm, I looked on his neck, his shoulder, I could not find a primary lesion. So with melanomas, you're going to look for primaries, and I could not find one. So at some point in his life, he either had a melanoma that was treated either by cryotherapy, um, and then, or you can have what's called regressive melanoma. So you can actually have a melanoma that disappears. So it might come as a lesion and then it just regresses. And then it just seeds out all its microcells and goes down the limb chain and invades the whole body. Again, if in doubt, if you're still not sure if you've gotten into core biopsy, then you want to do an excisional biopsy. Um, take it to the OR take a big chunk or take the whole thing out and get, uh, get you a diagnosis. And this just kind of talks a little bit more about the core needle and the fine needle biopsies. So if you think it's a true lipoma and you know what it is, you can just leave it alone. You can watch it. So a lot of times if you see bumps, lumps, and you'll see a lot of them in the office, you always want to measure them. Okay? You want to measure the size of it, describe it, and then look at it again when they come back in in three or four minutes. Um, or if you want to do it even just in one month, six months, but you always make sure you tell the patient to watch it. Because they will know more than you that you do if it's changed. Unless you, do, you know, but make sure you take good notes and always have your, I always carried my Maxwell with me because on the back side of it has a ruler. When I was at head and neck, I always carried one of those retractable little round ones because those are kind of easier to maneuver and get a better accurate measure. Um, now you can, now nowadays they can inject it with something called um, deoxylate, deoxycholate, which is Kybella. Um, it's usually used in cosmetics, but for those people who have those those uh, bottle necks or you know little fatty necks, they can inject those and um, get rid of the fat. So you can use Kybella. Um, liposuction. We didn't do a lot of that in plastic surgery with lipomas. I wouldn't think that it would work well because, you know, it's in a small little case and I would think that you would get more problems doing the liposuction because when you do liposuction, you actually do fanning. When you're doing a body area, you fan in and out. Um, so I would think with the lipoma, you might hit parts of it, you might leave tracks of it, um, but those are options. And so removing it, like I said, if you don't want to leave it alone, take it out for cosmetic reasons or if you're just really worried that it can be I would just have them better safe than sorry to get it removed. A little fatty chamber, there's a little life on that. He kind of looks like a frog. Do you see the frog? <laughs> so like we talked about earlier, complications of lipomas, usually if you take it out, depending upon the size, you'll be left with a big cavity. So normally, if it's a small lipoma, you shouldn't have any problems. Your body would reabsorb it if you developed a small hematoma, your body can reabsorb it. But if you're removing a large one, like that one gentleman had that one in the back, those usually will have either a JP drain or they'll just have what we call um, what's that kind of drain? It looks like it's just a flat rubber band. I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but we usually have those sewn into the um, into an opening into their skin. And it just kind of drains out through that little tube. Recurrence, the 
those are more generally with the intramuscular ones um, and infiltrating because they've gotten different layers. Subkey ones usually aren't uh, recurring. Once you take them out, they're usually gone. And then, or if they have a bilobar lipoma, you can result in a uh, recurrence as well. Questions about lipomas? How many dads have a lipoma? Who wants to add? Oh, you know, actually, I think Professor Rourke's dog has these little growths on his skin. So I don't know if they're lipomas. It's them on his little skin. Oh my gosh, epidermal cysts. Anyone in here know uh, pimple popper MD? <laughs> yeah. How many in here has ever seen a, I mean, other than on video, like in person, someone drinking an abscess? Or not abscess, a cyst, a cyst. Did y'all like it? <laughs> I will tell you, the first time you do one of these and you're stuck in a room, oh my gosh, they smell so <laughs> bad. Especially if they've been there, usually they're older people who had them, you know, for 20 years. So imagine oh. something stuck in an attic for 20 years. It's basically like that in a in their skin. And I remember one time I was in a room with my attending because he loved pop. He loved to pop abscesses. He loved to do epidermoid cysts. And I remember there was an abscess, and it was because with abscesses you'll see that they have pockets. So he he was squeezing, squeezing, couldn't find it. So then he had his little our little tool, um, and he kind of moved it around the inside, and he found another pocket. So then we went to squeeze it. He we went shooting out and hit his face. Luckily, he had glasses. I mean, if I was doing it, it would hit me right in the eye. But you have to be careful when you go popping things in offices that they shoot everywhere. So either put a mask on, um, or make sure you have plenty of gauze when you're um, pushing on them. So epidermoid cysts, they're also called sebaceous cysts or epidermal inclusion cysts or other terms you might hear them about. Um, most occur everywhere, anywhere, but most often I saw them on the back, um, on the neck. You can see them on the scalp and the trunk, um, but most of the time these are benign. Very rarely you can get um, cancers from these. So it's derived from the epidermis, the epithelium of a hair follicle. Again, things get plugged up. You get keratin, lipids, fat oils that deposit down into this cyst wall. Um, so a lot of times with these sebaceous cysts, you've got to remove the whole wall and sac. Because even if you push out the contents, what happens? They've got like this opening. A lot of times the debris and skin <coughs> tissue will just reaccumulate within them. So that's very common for that to happen. Um, the walls are very then, like it says here, and you can sometimes get an inflamed sebaceous cyst. Um, so those will come in looking infected, but they're just really inflamed. More common in men than women. I saw most likely in men. Um, but I had a what this says. So usually they have these um, little small pedunculator, like an opening in the in the cyst itself. So a lot of times when you see that, you'll know it's more likely a an epidermal cyst versus, let's say, a lipoma or um, I'm trying to give something else. But these have little centers to them. And I remember this lady in the trimester, and she came up because she had an x-ray of her chest done, and the lady in radiology saw something on the back by her bra line. And she comes in, and I look at it, I'm like, oh, it's just a sebaceous cyst. I guess somehow between the time I looked at it or touched it, it unhooked the top of it, and it started you know, creating that white cheesy substance and I was like oh yeah so I went and grabbed some <laughs> four by fours and I started squeezing and oh my god even though on the surface it looked like it was this big but it was so deep I mean I couldn't believe how much stuff came out of it and then afterwards it's just nice and smooth, smooth and flat but sometimes you can do that and they'll never recur but so, like I said sometimes it'll just recur again but she didn't have any pain it caused her any troubles but I was like I'm gonna get, get rid of it and she won't have to worry about it next time she gets an x-ray and then you can have pilar cysts, so those are usually on the scalp. So they look and act just like a epidermoid, just, I don't know if it's a, I have to ask Professor Hughes if they call it pilar, just because it's up on the scalp, but they look and act exactly the same. Again, 
again, usually these, again, are asymptomatic unless they get inflamed. Um, they have a foul-smelling, cheese-like discharge. So a lot of times patients will come in and tell you they squeeze it out themselves and it keeps recurring and they come in and they get real inflamed and so you have to squeeze it out. Um, but they have squeezed it at one point or another by themselves. Uh, like I said, it can become inflamed or infected. Um, with Jill's patient will have pain and tenderness. It'll look like an abscess. But when you push into it, it'll be still like that cheesy, curdy stuff that comes out. Um, again, rare cases, you can have cancers. So you watch again if it changes or it rapidly grows. Looks the skin gets friable, which means it's really uh, macerated, real funky looking, not the normal overlying skin. So on a physical exam, you have someone come in and look at it, it'll look normal, like normal skin tissue. Um, it can be firm, but most of my most of her are kind of soft and squishy. Um, Usually about half a centimeter to a centimeter. I've never seen one five centimeters. That's pretty big. But like I said, a central pore pump tank is normal. Um, you can have them anywhere, breast, genital areas, but most times you'll see them on the neck and the back <coughs> or the scalp. So see that little pump tank center right there? You can see it. And the other ones, you really don't see it as well. But sometimes they're really small. Like that one on the upper left, that thing's gone first. One little push and it would come right out. So those are pilar on the next scalp. See, does anything show on yours? Or is it just a black? Yeah. Drag it either right or left. Come on. Are you still on full screen on yours? Oh, you're trying to drag the video off the page? Uh -huh. Just drag the entire PowerPoint. Oh. Yeah, you can't drag the actual video. might have to click the YouTube and it'll watch on internet, not PowerPoint. How do I do that? Just uh, hover over the video and then click YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, right yeah just right there. there. And then Explorer is opening up. You'll see when she pulls this out, you can see um, 
can see that sack, so that little thin lining right there, that's the wall of the sack squeeze that she has to get out. You can just click watch anyway. I mean, if we're going to be doing it, we can watch it. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. It's like Miss Noble, and it's like just porn. <laughs> like, oh, well, this might be inappropriate. <laughs> okay. <laughs> exactly the right time. <laughs> When you first open it, this had a thing at the top that said like allow external leaks. Um, and then it has a look at this, look at this. It's <laughs> oh. It looks like a baby's face. A <laughs> baby. <laughs> That's what they called it. I can't get it to be bigger. Hey, oh, it's it's okay. Okay. It's it's okay. Okay. Who said okay? Who doesn't want to see this? Yeah. Yes. Hannah! Hannah's pretty I'm pretty 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 <laughs> Amazing baby faces. Mm -hmm. If you drag the corners of the box, it might make it bigger. Or it could ruin it. I'm just saying. Instead of just watching a huge screen and focusing on the tiny.
But how you get rid of it, mainly you have to take the cis wall out. So there's just another picture of it. So usually you'll have this gaping little, looks like a mouth up there. Um, but you'll pack that with packing so it doesn't, um, it'll start closing up by secondary intention. So when you IND something, eventually you will start packing, packing it, and they'll come back every two to three days. You'll remove the old packing, put it in, and then eventually you'll keep getting more resistance. So as the tissue grows from the in inside out, then you'll stop packing. Um, with these, very rarely do you have complications, but sometimes you can get scarring from them, um, infection. Again, malignancy is very rare, um, and I would refer them if it's an atypical place that you don't want to mess with. Can we move forward? Anybody take a break? Move forward? Okay. Last one, and then I'll let her know. I'll be done by a little bit. Is that okay? Do y'all want her to finish up the last part of her lecture? Mm -hmm. Any questions about epidermoids? You'll see them a lot. They're very common. Um, you may yourself may have had one or had one. Um, grandparents have them. Parents. You'll see them a lot. All right. Hyaline eye disease. Anybody know what this is? Mm -hmm. Y'all seen it? Mm -hmm. Where did y'all hear from? Uh, I used soft surgery. Oh. I remember my first job in plastic surgery. There was this young kid comes in, um, he'd been seeing the physician, and then he came in to see me one day for a removal of the packing. I had no idea, but how embarrassing for the 16-year-old kid. <laughs> and I had to have him turn over and remove his packing from his rectum in between his buttocks. But that was my first introduction to pylon eye disease. <laughs> Come on, Come on. So basically this, you can, these patients will present kind of in an array of ways, but most of the times they'll have an acute um, swelling or inflammation or drainage from an area right around their buttocks or the gluteal cleft. Um, back in the days, it used to be called Jeep disease. So back in World War II, um, those who drove trucks and um, truck drivers, car drivers, they would develop pyelonidal disease just from that being sitting, you know, being seated for so long in that chronic pressure and um, pain. So you'll see a lot of these in chronic truck drivers who drive cross country and stuff like that. Um, males, obviously more common than females. These are usually earlier, early teens to 20, so that guy, that kid that I saw was about 16. Um, but it's rare, of, well, it says rare over the age of 45, but I would assume as you get older, but maybe as you get older and drive, don't have as much hair back there. I'm not sure. Like when you see men who have, they start losing hair around their um, shins and their, even all their thighs just to do to chronic friction. So maybe as they get older, they may have less hair and tufts down the back of their buttocks. It's more common in Caucasians um, than African Americans or Asians. Um, again, I assume just because of hair pattern. So pylonidal means mess of hair. So basically, um, these people can have, they'll have like a little pocket or a cleft in their buttock and it just basically gets, they don't know exactly this, your body has this vacuuming effect where it sucks in the hairs into this little hole. Um, and then from there, your hair keeps collecting, collecting, and so you will get down to the treatment, but you have to keep removing the hairs. Um, so then what happens is inflammation causes secondary infection, and then you can get a sinus tract formation. So from the little um, hole, which is the dimple in the buttocks, you can develop a tract and have a cyst up higher from that. Um, it's polymicrobial if you do get an infection just because of the area. So there's lots of bacteria down there. Here's just a little picture of it. The sinus, and you have the little sinus tract uh, and the little cyst itself underneath and the hairballs. 
for Coleman and Carol. And that's just a little picture of the cyst. So you have a, a fundamental dimple. So a lot of these people may have congenital reasons why they have a dimple. Maybe they had spina bifida um, that didn't fully form. And just another slide picture. So you can kind of see how where it sits. And then a little sinus tract, so you can have a little pit um, and creates a tract and have a cyst up higher. Kind of already talked about it if you have a, a natal cleft or a spina bifida or colta. Um, those who just tend to be a little bit more hairy or you have other, you know, poor clogging problems like we talked earlier with hydrogenitis. Um, Again, these are just some risk factors that we talked about, sedentary, prolonged sitting, um, excessive body hair, so people who are really hairy tend to have more issues with this, um, bigger just because then you have more um, gluteal fold tissue and more hair and tough, and it just kind of gets all, and you sit on it, and it gets all more macerated and gluted. Um, and a congenital natal dimple age. I don't know if I know anybody that has that. And, or trauma to the coccyx. So a lot of times people have trauma there, um, or have had surgery there, you can have a higher risk of developing autonomic disease. So we talked about earlier, some of these people can just be asymptomatic, you just have a um, cyst down there, a bilateral cyst. But most commonly you're gonna see them coming, presenting um, with an acute infection. Um, or abscess, because it'll rupture, it'll drain, um, it'd be really painful for these patients. Um, and then it can develop into a chronic issue, chronic abscesses, chronic sinus tracts, chronic drainage, which would require um, surgery to remove the, the sinus tracts. So usually in these patients, how they present, they're going to be afebrile, they're not going to be toxic looking. Um, but they will have a inflamed red fluctuant mass, usually right up at the gluteal cleft, um, and they may or may not have drainage. If it's the first one, they may not have a tract, but if they've had chronic disease, they may have a sinus tract along with that. Um, less commonly, but sometimes you can develop a, a cellulitis around that area. So there's just a, a cyst, a bilateral cyst. So you see all the hair that surrounds that area, mm -hmm. and so it just kind of keeps collecting into the cyst if you have you know, if you have chronic disease. So there's a little dimpling, and so you can see up higher, maybe that's where the cyst had become, had formed. There's a large one, so that looks like it's been recent in healing. So we're hearing these open holes, so you can see how easily those hairs can get trapped in there, just from friction, from wiping, everything. Now, this is real bad. If you have to have it removed, then you can, um, to close the area if you have issues, because think about it, you're sitting on your bottom all the time. So it's hard not to sit, and with that you can have, you know, when you sit, you bend, you open, and it just recurs, and you can never get the area to close. So if you have surgery, sometimes you have to have what's called a wound back, and this is what this is that they place on it to help, to help that heal. It suctions out the, I don't know exactly the mechanism of a wound back, but I know it's like a, that gray stuff is like a foam, and then I think it just you know, sucks out all the moisture and the liquid and helps it keep from, or keeps it healing. I had one of these patients, he actually had, he was a paraplegic, mm -hmm. Um, and he had a decubitus wound right there that he could never get healed. And again, I work in the head and neck clinic, but my doc puts a flap anywhere. <laughs> so he tried to flap it, tried to do a gluteal cleft flap to close that uh, decubitus, but it just kept getting macerated, you know, because he's sitting and lying all the time. So we he had a huge wound back that I had to, like, change often with the nurse and check on it when he'd come in. And um, eventually, as it got smaller, it would trim and make the wound back smaller. But it's pretty gross. So here's like a Z-plasty 
on someone who had a pyelonephalosis. And there's a JP drain. You know, you when you're removing and moving things around, you're going to have cavities that like to fill up with serous fluid. So, really, no labs or imaging to diagnose it. It's usually a diagnosis by a physical exam and history. Now, you could get an MRI or CT scan if you're worried about um, a deep abscess or a fistula. Um, those would be important, especially if you're going to have to have surgery. I would get imaging. Um, consider CBC and wound culture, I guess, if it doesn't heal. Because you may be giving them the wrong antibody. It's growing something different rather than staph. It could be growing in anaerobic uh, bacteria as well. So there's an MRI. So what would happen to that guy, that kid, is he had that decubit eye that developed into a... Um, the perirectal abscess, it went deeper. That's why it was so hard to heal. Treatment for initial disease, you want to do an IV, so incision and drainage. Um, antibiotics, if there's a, you know, if there's significant cellulitis or infection, um, sabazolin or ANSEP is what that's called with metronidazole. Usually, I would use augmentin just because it would cover the anaerobic bacteria. So if you would ever have to admit someone, um, if they have severe cellulitis, or you're going to have surgery and you have to do a big excision, like that glass picture was. But an IND, you generally won't have to, unless they get um, really bad infected. So a lot of these patients, same thing, you know, you want to make sure the area is clean. You may have them use Hippoclans. Um, for our patient, he had dark hair. So we recommended after the um, inflammation and the healing process began that he get um, hair removal. You get laser hair removal, keep the hair away from that area. You may have to shave regularly to keep the tufts from reforming. Um, and then obviously avoid prolonged sitting. Um, but he used to have to come in that one kid because I had to remove the little hair from his crib, or the, yeah, the hole every week. <laughs> um, so simple IV has a 55% failure rate, um, which is not bad, but his, he actually healed, he healed well. He didn't have to have any extensive surgery. Um, he, the, I guess he had seen the plastic surgeon in the ER. And he came or in the ER and followed up with us in the clinic. Um, but you can have surgical excision, like I said, that would require hospital stay. Um, again, with any chronic inflammatory disorder, there's always risk of uh, malignancy, um, but it's rare. How many of you all start looking at your skin since you started these lectures?